Well, I just want to thank everyone for coming out today. It's been a, uh, it's been a really uh, kind of intellectually challenging four years that I've spent, uh, that we've, we've been working on this, in part because I think so much of what's happening in local is happening both slowly and so quickly. Um, and I think a lot of it also has to do with the fact that I, a lot of the community was rooted in industries that aren't driving much of the change. And so I wanted to start out just by, just by thinking about all of the different people that are in this room today. Um, today we have uh, everyone from uh, online ordering companies to delivery companies. We have uh, decade-old search firms like Yelp. We've got brand new search firms like Verb. We have companies that are helping businesses grow. We have companies that are helping businesses run. Right? This is no longer a local marketing conference. And so we were sitting here, we were thinking, what's bigger than marketing? How can you tie uh, payments, marketing, lead generation, all of these different parts that are, that are part of a marketplace? And how can create a broader concept for it? So I step, I step back for a moment. And I realize that so much of us talk about local um, with a sort of lack of discipline to a certain extent. And I think what we need to realize is how deeply our relationship with geography has, has changed in recent years. So I think uh, even on the, the small business pan, uh, social media panel, which was fantastic, people were talking about local meaning small, which I think a lot of us use. So small business, mom and pop, all these different terms we use. People will talk about local as meaning nearby, like proximity, of course, location. But this creates a really, really chaotic view of what local actually means. We're in a situation where it's actually becoming a liability for companies as they move from small startups to medium startups and approaching the public markets. Because if you go to an investor and you say, we're in local, they're thinking fragmentation, they're thinking self-serve, they're thinking expensive sales. When in fact, what we're dealing with is a much different world. And really what's at the core of this What's driving so much of this confusion is that we're thinking that this is a change in media. And it, don't, be, don't be upset about this. I thought about it too, in part because so much of the change in the 20th century was all about media. It was all about new tubes for content, right? You had radio come along in the beginning of the 1900s. You had television. You had Web 1.0, Web 2.0. And these were all about new ways to distribute content. And so, so much of the innovation in marketing, which is really about connecting businesses and consumers at its most basic level, was focused on innovation in media. So, so much of the way we thought about local was built around the, local, the way local media networks were set up. They were typically on a DMA level, and then you had a national. So you had these local city level organizations, because that's how newspapers were distributed, that's how radio was distributed, and you had national. So you had this really tense, um, tension between national and local. And that set up our understanding of local. One of my big points here, if there's any point you come, come away with this with, is that the innovation, what's actually driving innovation in local and what you do on a day-to-day -day basis isn't what's happening in media. It's what's happening in co commerce. It's what's happening in the actual very foundation of the local economy. These very, very tectonic issues that are, that are well below the floor level. There are changes in a retail model that hasn't really changed in the last 100 years. There are new models around delivery and pickup, which are actually expanding the market. They're not just taking it anymore. Grubhub isn't just taking uh, you know, pen and paper orders and putting them online. They're actually, because of the dynamics, the way these systems work, they're taking, delivery is taking a larger share than they used to. We're delivering more. I think there was a stat recently that said, I think delivery is now outpacing um, a certain category of restaurant ordering. That's insane. It's an actual change in consumer behavior. And so what I really want us to start thinking about, and, and I, was, I, I was part of this, I would think about local a lot like you thought about Sasquatch, right? I would talk about it uh, in anecdotes. I would talk about the ability to uh, you know, target, location, target locations of a, of a competitor's with certain messaging, and these are very neat things. All these media-related innovations. 
but I couldn't figure out any way to bring them together. And so I, I stepped back, and I realized that what we're actually talking about, what brings this together, what brings marketing commerce together, is this concept of local economies. And we didn't really have to think about local economies much because there was no alternative. That's changed as we all know it. So the way I define a local economy is the latest of industries that help us buy and sell in the real world. So this includes everyone from Macy's to your mom and pop down the street. It includes businesses that have local sales and e-commerce sales. But I really want everyone to start thinking about this as a separate market. And size doesn't matter in this case. So the local economy is the over $40 billion a year that we spend on ground transportation, that we spend to get home from work, to come here. It's what's powering Uber. The local economy is your neighborhood grocery store that charges way too much, but you like it because you know they're local, the guys are nice. But they're also the Wegmans and the Whole Foods that we indulge in sometimes. Local economy is that hotel room that many of you are staying in. It's the Starwoods and the Hiltons of the world, but it's also a number of new brands, whether it's HomeAway or Airbnb. The local economy is that really wonderful music venue that every city covers. It's small, unique. But there are also the giant sports complexes that we love to hate. I'm from Philly. I understand how much we hate, hate our own sports. Uh, it's that pesky apartment broker in New York that charges you like more than your apartment is worth. That's part of the local economy. Biggest, as we know, is the only almost half trillion dollars we spend every year at restaurants and bars. It's that pit in your stomach after a big night out when you look in your wallet, you have no more money. It's the local economy at work. So part of the reason that it's weird for me to talk about what the local economy is, because we never had to do it before. There was no real scalable alternative than selling in a brick and mortar marketplace. So over the last say 20 years, a virtual marketplace has emerged. But what's really important for everyone to realize is that the virtual marketplace is not the internet. A virtual marketplace existed. In 1998, catalogs and mail order, which is a virtual marketplace, was a $20 billion industry. 2015, it's a $21.4 billion industry, I think. Um, so this growth of the virtual marketplace hasn't happened, it hasn't been cannibalization of an existing one. So this just showing that the virtual marketplace has grown at a blistering rate. And what does this mean for us? What does this mean for the local marketplace? It means that there is now $240 billion less spent in local, mar mar local marketplaces than there was 10 years ago. Uh, this, is a, this is just data on the percentage of retail sales that go through virtual marketplaces, local marketplaces. 1998, it was a one-tenth of 1%, 1 maybe a little less. 2013, it's the latest data. This is all Bureau of uh, Labor Statistics data, so slow to update. Over 6%. Now, what I really want us to talk about is that we, want to, we understand that it's not like 6% across every industry. We know that the growth of the virtual marketplace has affected various local, local marketplaces in different ways. We know that, for instance, uh, a quick note about this data. The US Census, like most macroeconomic institutions, is wonderful and totally flawed. Um, they categorize uh, non-store businesses as a vertical alongside electronics and appliances. So all this is showing are companies like Macy's and um, Sears that sell primarily through store and sort of their breakdown. So don't focus on the actual numbers, focus on the, the trend lines. And what this says is that things like uh, car parts, sporting goods, hobbies, books, we know books for instance, have really been hurt. Things that you can put in a box and ship away. Versus food service and other home services goods hasn't really been affected as much because you can't put, it's hard to put a big tractor in a box, right? It's hard to put a meal in a box, even though people are doing that now. Uh, I think it was two years ago, Mike Daffrey came and gave an amazing presentation, and he quantified some of this, called it the local coefficient. This is the sort of manifestation of that. 
one thing I want everyone to realize is just how deeply embedded the local economy was in all sorts of different industries that maybe we didn't think of as local. This is just showing the decline in single copy sales for a number of the major magazines. It's hard to actually get the total figure, but what we know is that over the last five years, billions of dollars have been taken out of the local economy, out of that newsstand that you used to go to but you don't anymore, out of that convenience store, out of the 7-Elevens and the Wawa's of the world. They're no longer having this money come in. So even an information industry, even a media industry that you wouldn't think of local, has an information retail part of it, and it has an impact on it. So one thing that's important to realize is that until recently, the growth of the virtual economy has simply has been deductive, pretty much. It's shrunk the pie from which brick and mortar businesses can operate. For some businesses, that has a, there's something called the 10% rule in retail, which is a 10% decline in revenue can break the model. And we saw that there. But it hasn't been until recently that we've started to see the internet come out of its first major application, which was e-commerce. And we're bringing connectivity into the foundation of the local economy. So one thing that I, I struggled with was this idea that I look around, there's no flying cars, there's no store of the future that we've been promised, unless you're in Korea. There's not that much change in the actual atomic world, and yet our relationship with the physical world has changed so dramatically. So I was trying to figure out, what does that mean? What is causing that? This is the Italian market in Philadelphia. I think it's just a wonderful example of how little things can change. It's a phenomenal market. Its fundamentals as a market are great. It generally looks the same as it did, you know, 100 years ago. But our, we all know that our relationship with the physical world has changed so much. We all know that we took an Uber here. We didn't hail a cab. We all know that we don't go to bars hoping to you know, meet people that much anymore. We plan, we Tinder, we do what we do. But now, what's causing that change? Um, this is a quote from Peter Thiel, really famous investor, blah, blah. Basically said, we were promised flying cars and said we got 140 characters. I think people take that out of context. It's like, ugh, the future is, isn't what we expected. But I don't think people realize how important these information systems are. Twitter is an information system. He's waiting for the atomic systems that will come soon. How important these informations are, information systems are to building these really complex physical systems. And here's what I realized about local. What's changing isn't retail, isn't the store. Instead, behind every place, behind this place, behind the hotel, there's an information system that manages how people move through it. And it's these information systems that are vulnerable to change. Because the web is wonderful at information. It can understand, it can process in ways that we never expected. These information, are, these information systems, are, systems are everywhere. And they govern every bit of our movement, which is the, the local marketer's key currency, which is movement. These systems shape the way we move through the world. And a lot of the times, we don't think of them because they haven't changed much. These information systems, these local systems, are the public transportation timetables that let us know when to get to the train station and when we can get back to our homes. These are the uh, systems in our building when we're working late and the lights go off. And the security card looks at you kind of pissed when you need to go home. They are the signs on stores that let us know what that brand is, what it sells. It's also the mannequin in the window that lets us know if we're going to light the clothes inside. The information systems are the hours of operation that every single business has that let us know when we can come there, when there's going to be someone there, or when we might get arrested for breaking and entering. The information systems are the taxi dispatch systems. All that is information. How do we get demand for a cab to the drivers who are out there? It's also this new Uber model of automating using software. 
These systems are the street signs and street lights that are now more and more being networked that make sure our cities don't descend into a chaotic mess of car crashes. These systems make our cities work. And together, it's all of these information systems that we're all, everyone in this room is working on doing. So I wanted to take a second um, to, there's so many different examples of these information systems. I think Uber is probably the best, but I want to talk about one that's a little more um, applicable for everyone in this room. These information systems aren't reinventing their store. They're reinventing our relationship with it. And one of the big problems here is that a lot of folks have looked at the virtual economy, and they thought, that's the internet. But it's not. What we're seeing here is that web-influenced offline sales, the internet as a driver of our physical experience, is the single biggest category in American retail spending. About 8%, I think, more than non-web-influenced offline sales, and like 80%, just guessing here, more than, than e-commerce. It's not an edge case. Local is an edge case. It's the primary case. But what we also know is that it's not simply a re return to norm normal. That the, the changes in these systems that govern how we move between places are impacting our decisions about how moving between places. Uh, this is a, one of my favorites, uh, basically showing that offline retail spending is increasing, foot traffic to stores is decreasing. How, what, is, what explains that? It means that people are buying more. It means that s local search functionalities become more efficient. We are better able to estimate what's in a store, so we come with higher intent. And that deeply changes the economics of square footage in retail. This is another big thing, is that I think a lot of the, the Gen Xers and people in Gen Y who looked at the growth of e-commerce, they just think that's the internet. It's not. And what we're seeing is that mobility, as mobility brings the internet through all of our different experiences, we're starting to see new growth in store interaction. Uh, basically broken down, uh, Gallup asked all these people, how has mobile impacted your relationship with the store? And what we find is that 87% of millennials, people my age, are now using stores more because of mobile. And this is, this is the case. The internet no longer is a part of the purchase funnel. Connectivity is connecting the entire purchase experience, and the store is playing a role. What we see here is that uh, this is a Google study. Google does great studies. When do you use the store and mobile, various parts of your shopping experience? The store, mobile is throughout. And we go to the store primarily to fulfill. So what I'm saying here is that we all need to focus not on reinventing the store or reinventing place, but reinventing the systems that govern our relationships with it. And I think we've all been doing that. I think you all have been doing that. But I think it's a helpful way of looking at it. So I just want to quickly wrap up here. I have three key things to remember. One, stop focusing on media. I'm in the media industry, and I'm telling you not to focus on it. And it's just not driving the change. There's such deeper changes. Two, the, first, the virtual app economy was the first big application of the internet. It's not the only one. And three, the story of local today is the story of reinventing the information systems that govern the way we move through the world. All of these systems control movement. And for marketers, there's no bigger asset than movement. So I just want to thank everyone. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you for coming out today, and I hope to see you at our next event.